Good morning. It's right around the end of July, beginning of August, somewhere here. And a viewer just asked this morning in a comment for kind of a garden update, what's going on. So we're going to take a look around and probably do a little bit of work out here. So these are the new apple seedlings here, these two rows. And there's a few uh, grafted trees. Here's a bite knee. Most of those died uh, because the I put the rootstocks in too late and they just... It wasn't the grafts, the grafts took, but the rootstocks just wouldn't grow new roots and they're still kind of dying off. So I'm probably not going to get more than like half a dozen grafted trees out of about 50 rootstocks. Pretty dismal failure rate, uh, but that's just how things played out this year. So these are the new apple seedlings and uh, this one looks like it's sick. I'm going to leave it but it's, that one's probably not going to make it. The potatoes did okay. I mean, they're good enough. They didn't grow very well. I should have fertilized those more. Um, you know, these two beds didn't even, I didn't add anything at all. And I just fertilized them from the top with liquid manures. So like manure tea, urine and stuff like that. But when you do that, you really have to keep up with it. You know, if that's all you're using is soluble fertilizers, you, you have to do pretty regular applications. These are the candy onions. They did okay. Like some of them got big. I mean, this is a huge, this onion gets huge. You can see that one's like as big as my hand. These don't keep super well, I don't think. Usually when I've grown them in the past, I end up selling them at the market or eating them all. But these are ready to harvest. In fact, uh, let's just go ahead and pluck those right now. Uh, so typically people will say, you know, you harvest your onions when the tops fall over like this. Well, these have been mostly fallen over for quite a while, um, but don't be in too big of a hurry. Like if you don't need the bed space, they can still size up quite a bit as long as this stuff is green. So, you know, if they're kind of like this one here, if they're just flopping over um, and there's, you know, don't, don't be in a hurry to, to just pull all those out immediately because they may size up. These are pretty pretty well done and I think they're they're ready to come out so we're just gonna we're just for now we're just gonna pull them like this and leave them on the bed and then later I'm gonna come and pick these up and lay them out in the shade somewhere to cure So that's a nice little crop. The other onion crop didn't do so good. It's, a, it's an onion I never grew before. I don't know, the seedlings just didn't establish as well. Um, I've been eating them kind of just on a pretty regular basis, so I'm not gonna have many of those to store. You know, I wish this crop was about five times bigger, so I'll be uh, making a mental note of that next year and just trying to get in maybe like a full large bed of onions, including some more storage type varieties. These are actually volunteer Chinese cabbages. I've been trying to take care of them a little, hoping they'll actually head up. Looks like that one might do okay. You know, contingent on that I keep watering and fertilizing it, especially in a hot summer conditions. Chinese cabbage just really requires really high culture, you know, lots and lots of water and food. You just can't, you can't lapse on that stuff or they won't head up. From the, from the looks of these, I probably aren't going to head up that well anyway, but it's possible. And it doesn't mean you can't use them, uh, but if you want those really tight, crisp heads that you can make like kimchi with and stuff, you got to take care of them. So here yesterday evening, I planted parsnips. I usually plant those in late spring, early summer for eating over the winter. You know, I mean, you can eat them before that, but I think of parsnips more as a winter crop. That's when I want to eat uh, root vegetables anyway. And they take longer to grow than a lot of the other root crops that I would be eating. So a uh, very late, but what I did is I just planted them closer together this year. And so I'm, I'm just planning on harvesting smaller ones because normally you get, you know, parsnips that are three, four inches a across at the top if you plant them early and grow them, uh, you know, all summer and then eat them through the winter. So I can just pull them out as I need them all winter long. Got some pickling cukes here, cross country. It's just been cranking these out on a real regular basis here. I'm impressed. Got some ripe tomatoes, I've eaten a few, but pretty soon, you know, there'll be more than I can eat fresh, which is great. A little bit of basil here. Parsley, this will grow here all winter. Uh, I'll be eating this all through the winter. In fact, I want to plant a little bit more. Now I prefer, this type this is the italian broadleaf type to the curly type like this you know i like the curly type okay 
but it's harder to clean. It's, I just don't think it's quite as good. And I think the Italian might be a little bit hardier, but I'm gonna plant some more seed and try to get one more bed like this, like another three or four plants established. Cause it is really nice to have this fresh green stuff uh, through the whole winter. And you have to remember like it, it's growing fast now and I have plenty, but in the winter it really slows down. The other thing about this Italian parsley is it gets super, super uh, sweet in the winter time when the frost comes. It's almost like sugary, it's so good. Just to like munch on the stems in the winter. So here's my current upcoming lettuce that I'll be starting to harvest in the next, maybe like a week. Got some okra here that my friend gave me these plants. He's like, you wanna grow some okra? And apparently he just wants to know if I can grow it up here. Uh, I've been impressed so far. It's not something I usually grow. I mean, I've tried it a couple times, but these are doing real well and there's just kind of a steady crop. Like every other day I can harvest a few and there should be more and more of them. This is Bronze Beauty lettuce, planning to save seed. So I have one, two here and then another four or five or six over there. So I'm gonna have a crap ton of Bronze Beauty lettuce this year. I'll be listing that on the website. This is one of my, you know, standard go-to lettuces. Here's a young plant here, and I'll cut in a picture of like a, a big mature plant. Nice leaf lettuce. Uh, compared to most of the lettuces I've grown, I'd say it's a little bit hardier. I'll tend to use that as a winter leaf lettuce. Uh, still under cover, but you know, it's it seems a little to do pretty well in the winter time. Bolt slow, nice lettuce. It's an old variety too. If I recall right, I think it was from maybe like the 40s or something. I have two beds of peppers. I can never grow enough peppers. This one's looking a little wilty, like in a worrisome way. Yeah, so is that one actually. I better get some water on these guys. So you may notice that the bed's kind of like just loose dirt. That's because I've been practicing mostly clean cultivation this year. Dirt mulching or dust mulching. What I'll do is I'll water every five to seven days approximately and then as soon as the bed is dry enough to cultivate like the sooner the better but you don't want to work it when it's really soggy I break up the top uh, three to maybe three to four or five inches of dirt and just fluff it up like this so what you end up with is essentially like a mulch that prevents water from leaving the soil so water travels through the soil by capillary action a lot right so that means that it goes from one particle to the next, to the next, to the next, and it just kind of like wicks, it's like a wick, and it wicks its way up from one particle to the next. So what happens when you break those particles up and they're not attached anymore? Well, the water doesn't travel as well. So what we have underneath here is we have a wick that you can saturate deeply, and then that water slowly kind of equalizes and travels upward as, the, as it dries out or as the plants use it but it doesn't continue to the top and then evaporate out the top. <laughs> well, there we hit a rodent tunnel. So yeah, the, I'm a little behind, but you can see there's kind of a damp layer right here. Not as damp as I'd like it, so I better get some water on these guys. But at its best, this works pretty well and plants actually grow really well, well in dirt mulches. I know a lot of people consider it totally primitive at this point in time and you know mulch fundamentalists and stuff but this is the way that people grew food almost everywhere for ages for and you know it's in it and for a reason you know there are, re there are reasons if you think of alternatives to doing this ask yourself like what resources you have available to make those alternatives happen that people may not have had when doing large scale like serious subsistence agriculture in the past you know we're thinking about to me it's just another tool you know i'll use it when i need it so this is my favorite pepperoncini these are just about ready to pickle right here you want to get them before they get too mature here's another one look at the look at how many peppers are in there this is called the cigaretta de bergamo which means cigarette of bergamo bergamo italy it's an Italian pepperoncini variety. So if you buy pepperoncini in the store, the little pickled green peppers that you get in like uh, delis and stuff, they'll be kind of like shorter and blockier with a blunt nose. This is just a different type. Collected as many as I could one year or a couple years, actually a few years and tried them all together. And this is hands down my favorite one of the bunch. It's uh, very tasty, very tender. Uh, it's not hot at all. You know, not that I mind a hot pepperoncini once in a while, but it's actually really tender. Like the flesh is tender and not crispy. Some people really like crispy 
for pepperoncini, that's just not really what they're supposed to be to me. Now, I'm not saying they're soft or gushy or anything like that. They're just, they're tender. And uh, yeah, I love these things. So any day now, maybe even today, I'll be picking a batch of these and starting to uh, ferment them. And then in about a few weeks, I'll have them to eat with sandwiches and tomatoes. And oh my God, it's going to be so good. I lost my seed for these and I had to order this seed on eBay. It looks like the right variety. Uh, we'll see when they're actually pickled if everything works out or not. But yeah, I had to search to find this seed. Otherwise, I have some Anaheims here. Anaheim is an excellent pepper. I highly recommend growing it because it's so versatile. So like the green chilies for chili rellenos and other like Mexican dishes, the roasted green chilies are usually Anaheims. Dried California chilies that you make chili powder out of, also used in a lot of Mexican cooking are dried Anaheims, dried ripe Anaheims. They're good, just, you know, like the ripe red peppers roasted are excellent for salsas and all kinds of other stuff. You can use them in stir fries, Italian food. I mean, they're just super versatile, so big fan of Anaheim peppers. So this is a new pepper I'm growing, which is just um, like impressively productive. Look at these, just, they're just everywhere and there's just tons of new flowers. And so this is called Clary Cheese. C-L-A-R-I cheese. And it's going to be, a, as I understand, a small, you know, what they call a cheese pepper, basically this shape right here, but red. And I, I'm hoping it'll be good for pickling whole. So this is Amish pimento. This should be a ripe red sweet, uh, thick walled. Again, I'll probably ferment a lot of those. Um, as you know, pimentos for like putting on pizza and salads and all kinds of stuff like that. Another very productive pepper is uh, cayenne. So this is probably just the kind of your average like long cayenne pepper. These will get turned into hot sauce when they're red ripe. Look at all those peppers. I think that's all I planted for peppers this year. There's just never enough to do all the stuff I wanna do with peppers. So here's a few eggplants. One of them got uh, eaten by a gopher over here, bare spot there. This one is uh, one that my friend used to get at a local drugstore every year. Like they'd put, you know, the vegetable plants for sale out on the front of the store. And he would buy this six packs of these little eggplants that just said Japanese eggplant. So fortunately I saved seeds one year and grew them out because that's the year they stopped carrying it. It's just super productive. Um, take a look at like, take a look at this. These are, this is Grandpa Ott's Morning Glory. It's called Grandpa Ott's. Look at that. One, two, three, four, five in that cluster, plus six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then nine, 10, 11, 12, and more. I mean, I mean, this thing is just insanely productive. Now you pick them very small about like this so this one's ready i mean i could let this go another day or two but that's about how they're at their best for this size for grilling you know just maybe slice them in half put olive oil on them and throw them on the grill you know or anything else to where you'd use an eggplant and it is a hybrid because when i started to grow it from seed they came out you know a little bit variable but not too much and not you know not so much that i wouldn't just keep growing them but they're less much less uniform uh grown from seed so my corn just started tasseling maybe like five days ago and uh, you know, the silks are out. I mean, some of them, you know, like each day, like this one just probably popped out like last night, that silk right there. So usually I'll come in here once a day, pull off one or two of the uh, tassels up here that has a lot of pollen and then just kind of shake it on there. So if we take a look at like, like this one, watch, watch the pollen here. You see the pollen falling out? You hear the bees? They're getting the pollen. Because of course, pollen is a major part of the economy of the hive. It's like the protein food that they grow new bees with. You know, just kind of like dust a little pollen on the new silks. But take a look um, here on the leaf. Look at all that pollen. So, you know, it's very unlikely that this is going unpollinated when there's that much pollen just sitting on top of this leaf here. I kind of like doing it anyway, and it might reduce like the incidence of unfilled rows. So yeah, I'm real happy with how this corn did. I kind of have flaked out on fertilizing it for the last couple of waterings. Like the way I've been growing this, again, I didn't dig much of anything in. I think I added some chicken manure to one row, like just down the center. 
but otherwise it's this is all soluble fertilizers so this is all like uh, chicken manure tea and mostly urine so i just pee in a bucket you know run it along the uh the bottoms of these rows right before i water and water it in but despite not having fertilized at all for like the last three waterings you know it's cool everything's good they're a lot taller than me so i'm happy multiple ears forming in each stock like this one has two some of them have three that doesn't mean they'll all develop well but looking good see this one has two here's another new new one right here this is a what is it an american heirloom that was grown in italy or vice versa it's called a floriani never had it before it has a reputation for tasting really good this is a yellow jacket nest right there under that brick i actually tried to kill it um, by putting a hose in there and just running it for like a half hour and that didn't work my go-to way to kill a yellow jacket nest is to dump rubbing alcohol down there and then slam you know a rock or a brick over the top of the hole usually usually not always but usually there's only one hole so like right now they're not even flying yet like they're not awake yet i'm not afraid of these guys because i work here every day and walk by and they just they don't care they, they know i'm not a threat or they don't think i'm a threat i am actually but i have to dig these bulbs out um soon to free this bed up and just to get them out before the rain so i'm gonna actually have to kill that nest so what i'll do is i'll take a bottle of rubbing alcohol i'll dump it down there like half to a whole bottle and then immediately and that keeps them from flying out because the the entrance is plugged up while i'm dumping it in and then i'll have a rock usually a big round rock you know something and i'll slam that over the the nest so it really beds in and seals it really well and that works that works really well they're super annoying but they are actually useful like they'll clean up dead things really really fast like if i throw a dead mouse out it's gone in a day completely just stripped to like a little bit of fur and bones so they are useful they have a place but you know it's like i have to dig this bed out it, you know but if they don't perceive you as a threat they're not gonna they won't mess with you you know they have better things to do than pick fights so here's uh, my other tomato patch, and they're doing really well, but I noticed they're starting to get blossom end rot. I should have dealt with that sooner. So last night, like you can see right here, I dumped some calcium water on here, and I'm gonna tell you uh, how I do that and why. But these are starting to get blossom end rot, and that's really bad because you can lose a huge amount of your crop to blossom end rot. There's one right there. What happens is the end will turn brown, like. The tomato may ripen or partially ripen, but once it gets it, that tomato's kind of a loss. There's another one right there. Now, from what I've read and been told, it's basically some kind of a physiological issue having to do with uh, calcium levels, but not quite as simple as just having calcium available always. Uh, my soils have plenty of magnesium, so I don't think that's really an issue in there. What I've done in the past, and it's really hard to test this and know for sure if it works without doing some kind of like A-B test, but it seems to work, is I use calcium water. So it's really like the old term for it is lime water. And lime water is water that's been sitting on top of calcium hydroxide lime. So most of the lime that people use now is just ground up limestone. It's actually magnesium limestone, uh, dolomite, which, so it has, a, it has calcium, but it also has a lot of magnesium. So in the old days, it was really common for farmers to burn their own lime. So what they would do is get limestone or shells, build a small kiln, which is not that hard. I have videos on, on doing this, burn the lime, and then when you add just like a little bit of water, it turns into a fine powder. If you're a farmer and you're, you're gonna say like in the 1800s, how are you gonna crush a bunch of just limestone rock, right? You know, what are you gonna do? Hit it with hammers or something to try to get it fine enough to apply to your, your field? So they would burn it and it would fall into this fine powder and just be ready to spread on the fields. So there's another difference though. That lime is much more active and it's gonna, affect a much larger change much more quickly. I don't think anyone really does that anymore. Um, if they do, it's very uncommon and I haven't heard of it. Everyone uses just the powder, rock powder, right? But that's not as fast acting. So when I burn lime, I store the lime putty in water and that water becomes saturated with calcium 
up to a certain point with calcium hydroxide and that is really fast acting. So what I'll do is I'll take that and I water that bed with it and then I water that in. I also, when I'm tanning hides, if I have a batch of hides in lime, I'll take that leftover lime water and put it on my tomatoes. And that's even you know better because it's full of like dissolved proteins and bacteria and stuff. So yeah, I do have some blossom end rot. So already because I wasn't on top of that and not paying attention and not thinking ahead, you know, like planning ahead to just do that as a preventative measure, you know, like a prophylactic measure. I've already lost part of the crop um, to blossom end rot, and I'm seeing like a you know a few here and there. It doesn't look too horrible. Like this is uh, this is Polish linguisa. I've harvested, I think. If I recall right, maybe like 40 pounds of this off one plant. It's a pretty often huge Roma type, you know, canning type of tomato. You can see like, look at these monkeries down in here. But a lot of these Roma types do get uh, blossom end rot really bad. This is uh, Vilmini, something new I'm growing that's supposed to be blight resistant. But I'm already, you know, that kind of looks like blight to me. So that's the other thing I want to do today is get in here with clippers and take off any of these infected leaves. Anything that looks like it's getting infected and yellowing and anything that's like really low down laying on the ground where the fungus can get in there and infect the leaves. And get more circulation under there and hope that uh, that helps with that problem. You know, I think the blossom end rot doesn't look too bad. I got some calcium on there last night, so I'm gonna water that in better today. Here's a uh, summer squash I'm really disappointed in. It's called saffron. My favorite summer squash is crookneck, just the old school yellow crookneck squash. It's often called like golden summer yellow crookneck. And I thought, well, I'll try this improved, you know, summer yellow squash that's like a crookneck. They took all the good qual flavor qualities and the quality of the actual fruit and bred that out and just made it prettier or something i don't know it hasn't grown well i just cut off all these leaves because they were totally yellow if you look at the zucchini right next to it you know it hardly has a yellow leaf on it and it's super super healthy so totally unimpressed with saffron will not be growing that again it has almost no flavor unlike you know again uh, just the classic yellow crookneck is super flavorful my green beans have done really poorly this year i don't maybe someone knows what this is i'm, I'm thinking it might be some kind of an insect yeah, it kind of looks like it has some kind of a thrip or something like that, but all the leaves are like curled in yellow like this, and it's not just this batch. There's more over there that have the same problem, and then the beans will get all weird like this, or they'll just curl up like that. I'm not sure what that is. Now here's the next crop of lettuce after the one I just showed you, and then this is the one that just came out before that. So the way I do lettuce, let me go over here. When I plant the seedlings out like this, I start a new batch of seeds in flats in the greenhouse. That timing just seems to work out really well, especially if you plant like three different varieties of lettuce. I have two different varieties here. You know, plant a leaf lettuce and some head lettuce. Typically I would plant like a romaine, the bronze beauty leaf and then esmeralda the butterhead is is my go-to that's the main crop but the butterheads will like all form at once so you want a little bit of variety to spread that season out but if you do that timing where as soon as you plant these seedlings out of the flats into the ground just start a new batch of seeds that just works out just about right it's real easy to remember you don't have to have some kind of you know calendar or anything like that and these i just planted out they're just kind of getting established you know, in this climate, like I could plant them directly in the sun and just water them two or three times a day, but the shade cloth helps uh, so much. Like in this kind of climate, shade cloth is just a godsend. Uh, beets, I think I planted in another video. They're doing really well. You know, there's some real lunkers under there. I don't try to grow young tender beets. I just grow beets and eat them. I find that they're perfectly good to eat all the way through to next spring. Like if I planted the, a huge bed of these, I could eat them all summer, grow them through the winter, and be eating them in the spring until they start to go to seed. But what I do is I plant a small crop now, or sorry, in the spring, as early as possible to get early beets. And then uh, right around now, I'm gonna, you know, I started, uh, we'll go see, I started beets in the greenhouse uh, for a second larger crop for the winter. So I'll plant an area, you know, this big or bigger to beets for winter beets. 
Plus, I'll still be eating these for quite a while, as you can see. Beets are a pretty efficient crop. You can get a lot of, you know, beets out of a small area. Plus, you can eat the greens if you like those. This bed's supposed to be carrots, but I've been waiting. I didn't plant carrots this spring. This is so typical. This is this is like vid life here, right? This is, this is what it's like to be a YouTuber. I didn't plant carrots when I planted those, otherwise I'd be eating massive amounts of carrots out of here because I wanted to make a video, right? Like I want to make a carrot video. I spent, you know, a lot of time like planning that video and everything. I did a pre-shoot just to, you know, whatever. Anyway, I didn't do it. So I have no carrots and I have no video. <laughs> So I'm still saving this section, but pretty soon I'm just going to plant it. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe today's the day I'll make that video. Get out my notes and get it together and do it. Yeah, that's pretty typical. Here's one straggler apple that came up late. This is Becca's crab with Wixen. That's pretty exciting. Becca's crab is this little cherry-like single bite apple. And I just want to make improved versions of it. It's pretty neat. These are my seedlings for the winter. Uh, turnips, uh, rutabagas, yellow beets, red beets. Lettuce, which it looks like, did I plant the lettuce? Like it's just not coming up. Like this is my friend's flat and her lettuce is coming up, except it's getting eaten. But mine just didn't come up. So I may have to replant that lettuce. I have no idea what's up with that. Oh, look at that. This mouse probably ate some of these last night before it found this trap, so. Good thing I set that trap. I would say I've trapped at least 20 mice in this greenhouse this year. Early on, it was just one after another after another, and now there's still, you know, more all the time. That apple tree right out there is where I throw the mice. I've probably thrown 100 dead mice on that tree. So this is my friend's uh, flats for her winter garden. The thing is, people don't grow winter gardens here, which is crazy because you can have just as productive a garden, sometimes almost more, uh, through the whole winter and you don't have to root cell or anything. Leave it in the ground and pull it when you're hungry. It's so great and hardly anyone does it. It's strange. I think they just don't know or people just think of gardening as a summer thing. The thing is you have to start these winter crops in July, right? So you're the farthest thing from your mind is like a winter garden in the winter time. So if you know the timing though, about uh, if you're in California or a similar climate, about mid-July is a good time to start root vegetables for the winter. You wanna start the greens, like uh, salad greens, lettuce and stuff like that a little bit later. But mid-July is, is the perfect time to uh, start roots and flats and the reason I do them in flats is because the space in the garden isn't open yet right so I got all those potatoes and by the time these are really ready to go out I can start to dig those potatoes out in mass and prepare the beds but there isn't enough space for all these winter crops right now so if I start them in flats here I get them established they transplant really well no problem so the other thing you want to put in though right now is um, I'm probably for going to forget something, but definitely carrots. Like you want to seed your carrots in the ground in uh, mid-July, and I'm at the end of July. But being two weeks late here and there isn't too bad. And as you can see, these were put in about a week ago. Amazing free food all winter. Well, it's not free, of course, but there's probably close to a thousand um, wachuma. This one got pulled out. Mice and birds will come in and pull these out because they think they might be interested in them. But of course, once they do, they're not interested. They're like, what's this? Ew, it's nasty and bitter. Who would eat that? Anyway, these are all seedlings, so they're genetically unique. Um, most of them are intentional crosses that my friend made, so they're actually not just random seeds. And I have no idea how I'm going to move. Well, by the time I plant those, I'm going to have like 1,500 seedlings or something like that. By fall, I'm hoping these will be, you know, like three, half to three quarters of an inch and I can pull them out and send them to people bare root. Uh, of course, I'm going to list them on the website, but, you know, I don't know how I'm going to move that many. I'm just growing them anyway. So there's quite a few bite me apples, even though it's not a good apple year. Um, it's a pretty productive apple. It's, a ver it's very vigorous. As you can see, it's pretty big. Like I have a, a limb grafted on the side of this tree and the limb is bigger than the rest of the tree. It's very vigorous and it's pretty productive. So this isn't a great year, 
because last year there was just a massive crop, but even in off years, it'll tend to produce a few apples. So I need to get in here and bag uh, any more fruit that I didn't bag. It looks like I got most of it. You know, if I don't bag it, the, the birds will take care of it pretty quick. And I made quite a few cross pollinations on the bite me this year, which is I think the first year I've made any cross pollinations using bite me. Uh, here's sweet 16. There's Wixen, Vixen, Wixen Rubiot Cross. So that's pretty cool because it has like a red fleshed apple that already has Wixen genes in it. And then Bite Me is a Wixen seedling. So I'm kind of like back crossing those genes together or whatever the term is. There's Rubiot in here, Sunrise, Appaloosa, Pink Parfait. So it looks like I'm gonna get some seeds from that this year. A lot of my seed uh, pollinations didn't make it or the birds have already taken care of them. Now I'm keeping a close eye on this from here out. Uh, this is an August ripening Wixen seedling. And I only had it for the first time last year. So I'm real excited to see what it does this year. These are terrible, terrible fruit bags. Okay, this one, non-woven cloth with the red twisty tie, which is a terrible idea because birds see red really well. They're like, hey, that's food. They just break down in the sun super fast. You could probably see this is a little bit weak already. And I just put this on not that long ago. If you staple these out in direct sun, two weeks, they're just falling apart. That's how bad they are. So I'm keeping a close eye on these um, so I don't miss them. And, you know, I'm basically just looking forward to seeing what the quality of this is like as the years go by and the tree gets more established. This is my melon patch. There's actually a lot of melons in here. There's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I can see 10 just like right here. There's probably, you know, 30 melons in this patch. Unfortunately, none of them are ripe. I keep coming out and hoping to find that one that's starting to yellow up. It's a little honeydew melon, super good. Can't wait to start eating those every day. I have three different varieties of artichokes in this main row. They just cross pollinate randomly. So this year I went around the garden, I picked up seedlings that were, I found growing and I tried to pick the ones that looked like they were probably closer to the most primitive one I have, which I like for several reasons. And I planted those in this row here, one, two, three, four, to just see what they would turn out like. And they all flowered this year, which is great. So what I kind of want is I have this really primitive one. It has really sharp spines, so it's hard to handle, but it has the best flavor. It's quite a bit different than like a modern artichoke. You can see these scales here. Look how they're closed. They're super tight, right? They're, cl they're completely closed. And that means that bugs can't live in them. So one of the biggest problems with artichokes here is you get earwigs, these little pincher bugs, and they live inside the scales and they poop in there. They're, it's just disgusting. Now, if I could breed a one of those primitive type artichokes that has closed scales like these but no spines like this one that's what i'm after so i've already got a promising artichoke which is also late look at these haven't even opened yet so it's also super late which is interesting because that could extend the season and it has no spines but it has closed scales. It looks like some of the scales on the top might be open, but th these are really old, so it's hard to tell what it's actually gonna be like um, earlier in the season. I don't remember, I might've taken notes. If I, if I could, I would definitely do some intentional breeding or just like large uh, seedling selection trials just to see what comes out of there. Pretty promising so far. I'm definitely gonna be propagating that plant right there. I wanna uh, get some mulch and fertilizer on that and, and get it happier. So it grows a bunch of shoots and then pull those shoots off and plant them elsewhere. Cause any year, like a gopher could get in here and just wipe that thing out and it'd be lost forever. Chard growing here. Again, that will overwinter so I can eat that through the winter. Um, I need to replace that one. I try to go into the winter with like, you know, eight or more kale plants and quite a few chard plants. So there's the garden tour, what's happening. Things look pretty good. I mean, there's a few fails in there. That's gardening for you. That's how it works. Uh, but overall things look good and on track. I'm starting to get quite a bit of productivity and that's really going to ramp up from here on out. You know, I'm eating stuff regularly, garden pasta with like onions, tomatoes, zucchini, okra. Pretty soon I'll be adding peppers to that. I have basil. I have all the lettuce and more that I could eat. I have as many cucumbers as I want. Uh, you know, and I'm ready to start doing some uh, preserving. Like uh, mostly it'll be uh, lacto-fermentation, like fermented pepperoncini, 
uh, pickles and stuff like that. For right now, I'm going to get some water on these peppers because I don't, they don't look good. They're wilty. The leaves are wilty and the actual peppers are wilty on the plants. It almost looks like I missed that bed. Yeah, maybe I didn't water it long enough. I don't know what, but anyway, it needs water. So I'm going to get water on that and start another round of watering. So my watering thing is usually I'll, I'll have a couple days off and then I'll start a new round. I'll try to get like a third or a halfway through the garden uh, in one day, but you know, water's limited. So even if I would kept up on the watering, like I could actually get it done in one day, which is, would be challenging. There's just not enough water. So I have to water over several days. And as I go, I re-mulch the surface. You know, I do the, the cultivation dirt mulch thing as I go through the garden. And then that buys me another, you know, five to seven days before I have to start over again. So it looks like it's about time to start again. So other than watering that today and getting on some watering, I think I'm gonna prune up those uh, tomato leaves and try to clean them up a little bit. Water that calcium water I put on the tomato bed in a little bit better and start thinking about that carrot video, uh, planting some carrots and getting that video done because I need to get the carrots in and I need to get the video done. So we'll see.